All righty, so it means we're ready to work, right? Ready to put our thinking caps on, ready to take our notes. We had a fantastic first half of the day. If you do agree, put your hands together. What a day, what a day, what a day, what a day we've had. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Online viewers, make sure we're back from lunch. Make sure you have your pen ready to take down some notes and also to write down questions you have so that at the end of the master class, we can actually field your questions. Um, if you're in-house as well, please make sure that your phone is on silent. Your books are in your bags as well. Um, we are trending. Thank you for liking, sharing, commenting. Keep, keep tweeting. Our hashtag is the bold new normal. Spell it out fully. So the moment we've been waiting for, this is honestly the climax of our event, a masterclass delivered by the author of The Bold New Normal and the visionary behind this movement. Can we put our hands together for Lucy Quest? Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, let's go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Come on, let's, let's sustain the clap. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So make sure your phone is on silence. We really want to take this in and just, you know, make it honestly an action-oriented session. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, Hillary. You're welcome. Um, what a day, not what a morning. What a day it's been so far. Um, and thankfully, I managed to get some lunch, which um, was important considering that I hadn't eaten the whole day. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch too. We are going to have an action-packed 90 minutes of masterclass, and then we're going to pause, and we're going to do a Q&A for 45 minutes. So literally, you need to sit back, but be fully engaged mentally, because we have um, over two hours, two hours, well, what's the math? Two hours and 15 together. Mm -hmm. This is your time. If you don't have your notebook to hand, please grab it. And if you don't have a notebook, then ask for one. Right. Can we have that ball, please? Sure. Would you like more than one? Um, actually, yes. Can I have three of them? If you catch it, you keep it. For now, not for now, not, not. No, you catch it, do you keep it to answer my question? <laughs> <laughs> Who has the ball here? Tell me one thing you've written down in your book this morning or today. One thing, anything from any session, anything that crossed your mind to write down, what have you written? Yes. Uh-huh. Excellent. Thank you. Over here, the lady with the hair I've been admiring. Tell me. Excellent, thank you. Gentlemen, oh, you didn't tell us your name. My name is Dorcas. Okay, Dorcas, thank you. I'm Samuel. Yes, Samuel. Samuel. So what I've also picked up today is that your mindset affects your attitude and your results. So Excellent. you have to get a right mindset. That will help you get what you are looking for. Excellent. So if you haven't noted anything down, make sure that you are writing right now. Um, you know, when I heard Luigi singing, I, I really, I, you know, it took me back to, you know, Lucy, you need to try harder with your music. Um, and I thought, you know, you know, I, I will, I'll just have to keep practicing. Maybe one day I'll also get to sing Bononie, Bononie. Uh, so I should, I should keep the practice going in. He doesn't have any competition for me to worry about, but I will keep trying. Um, You've encountered people today who have decided that in spite of the expectations, in spite of the challenges, 
they'll do something different. And I just want to remind you that the conference isn't about a place for people to just talk. This conference is for people who actually want to take action. And that's why you're here. I said it this morning and I'll repeat it. Those of you in person, those of you virtually who could be doing anything else have to, to have chosen to be here. So, can you, for me in a moment, cue the summary video from the first panelist? I'll tell you when to play it, but let's not, not play it right now. Um, so this morning, you heard from Julie. We talked about agriculture, and we talked about the need to feed ourselves. We are a continent with the most arable land. 60%, David said it, I knew that already. If you can't feed yourself, if your stomach is not full, you can't do anything else. And it's not a matter of just my stomach and your stomach being filled. Every person in this country and on this continent needs to have a full stomach to make a meaningful contribution. She talked about the need to assess opportunities and to learn. And as I tell you about each of these panelists, I want you to tell you, uh, you know, a fun fact that they didn't talk about. So Julie has also won a Farmer of the Year um, award as well. I think it was 2021, was it? Or 2020, right? What she's doing is not just, oh, me too, I'm doing some. You can see she's smart, she's educated, she's farming. And she's doing it in a way where she's applying herself and standing out. So there is recognition in ag agriculture as well as money. In education, you heard from DEX Technologies. And the thing that's so important about what DEX is doing is that as much as People sometimes feel science and mathematics are for some people and not others. Actually, we all need a baseline of understanding of especially science. Enough mathematics so your accountant doesn't cheat you um, and you can pay your taxes appropriately, but especially on the science element to engage your, your mind and solve problems and even understand the world around you. And when I first met um, Charles, it was so, so many years ago, and that rudimentary set that he's talking about, I saw it. There was nothing to it. Really, there was nothing to it. It was a small PCB board, right, printed circuit board, some resistance. Is Charles behind me? Oh, Charles, I'm dissing you, small eh? <laughs> It was some circuit board and stuff, and we went to a school in Matahiku, and he was displaying it, and he said, you know, Lucy, come and have a look. Today, his product, product range has 10 different science sets, beautifully packaged. In the time that I've known him, beautifully packaged. That actually responds to the curriculum, so it's not random stuff. A friend of mine saw this science set and reached out to me, based in Sierra Leone. I said, sure, I know the guy. Charles now sells to schools in Sierra Leone. He sells to schools outside of Africa, in the UK. Because you see, some of the problems we're solving are not uniquely African problems. Many of them are uniquely the problem of people who are disadvantaged, but that is not just an African thing. So if you can solve a problem here, remember David talked about the customer, and you can then find another customer who looks like your customer, that customer will also buy. Fun fact about Charles is that when the UK government held the UK Africa Investment Summit in 2020, I think he was the only young entrepreneur from Ghana who was um, invited over to come and share his story to a room full of 21 heads of state. Now, why they all haven't uh, given him a hug and made sure that Actually, let me take this off so it doesn't disturb you. I think it's clicking. Um, they all haven't embraced him and said, Charles, when can we scale this across the continent? 
your guess is as good as mine, but we're here to make that happen. <laughs> you heard from Arabna. I've told her that that speech, I need a copy of it. You too, eh? We'll collect it and post it. Arabna, we, we need it. Yes, we need it. You know, who doesn't love fashion? But, and you can see me in my wear gun, of course. I don't need to tell you that. We all love fashion. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the more time you spend with Irabna, she'll tell you about how many trillions of dollars the fashion industry is worth globally. And she'll tell you that even if you have a small fraction of a trillion dollar industry, that's a lot of money. So she's not busy thinking about, oh, you know, me and my area people, and this one copied the dress, so blah, blah, blah. The thing is big out there. Stop getting into the petty um, 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 squabbles. And I love the trick, the trick that she has in the, they have in the name, wear Ghana, right? It's a message. It's a mindset shift that says, wear Ghana, simple. Fun fact about Irabna. Irabna went to, um, uh, uh, it must have been a fair or an ex exhibition all the way in Zambia. She took copies of The Bold New Normal to Zambia, and she gave the former head of state of Zambia a copy of The Bold New Normal. Yeah. So when we say, you know, we should be ambassadors and that this is a movement, it is. We need to impact each other. We need to convince each other that we can do it. David talked about the two Africas. And what you don't want is a situation where the, the Africans who are really changing the continent feel tired because they can't see that somebody else is supporting them, that somebody else is like-minded. Because if we keep hearing the opposite story, eventually we're like, why am I doing this? What's the point? So before I go on, let's replay the introduction, the introductory video um, of the panelists from this morning. Nation building calls for sacrifice. It's a stream. Hi, my name is Sarah Nanjaman. I am co-founder and CEO of Wear Ghana. I'm a proud Tama girl. I come from a huge and very supportive family. Um, I attended here in USD and I'm madly in love with Africa. So at Wear Ghana, our vision is to become Africa's most loved brand. We are using the business of fashion to do three things. We want to celebrate African excellence, inspire the next generation of African entrepreneurs, and create opportunities for women. Hello, welcome to Yamashi Biotechnology. It's so cute. Mm -hmm. I am an immunologist by training. So this is our lab. Uh, this is our molecular biology lab here at Yamachi. Um, Yamachi's work primarily focuses on um, understanding cancer among people of African descent. Hello, I'm Liliana Santodati, the executive director for Agri-Impact. The project is focused around the youth because we wanted to get the youth involved in greenhouse vegetable and production. We do whatever it takes to get the work done. So we are not really looking at the difficult circumstances. So somebody has to grow the food that we eat. And my name is Ophori Charles Antetem, um, co-founder at Next Technology Limited. For me, as individuals in changing our mindset, beginning from that point, in believing that it is possible beyond our wildest imagination. It is possible. We could be the generation that makes Africa great. We could be the one that lets it down. For every success, there are countless failures. Fail fast, then you can know what else to do. Take bold decisions. We will have to make the bold investments that are required to really see that change come to pass. The topic now shouldn't be um, the reason why you stop pursuing anything that you are passionate about. History is full of people who have not taken it over that. The Bold New Normal for Africa. I, I, I love the title because 
then it changes what normal looks like. The bold new normal conference. I believe that the, the concept of the bold new normal is, is, is perfect. Thank you for that. So please grab your notebooks and, okay, the feedback is gone. And write down anything you, that has come to mind now that you hadn't thought of b b previously. And I hope everyone online is doing so as well. If you got a soft copy of the notebook, then please follow along um, in your notebook, but please capture um, your action plan as we go along. So um, if anybody online is willing to share something they learned from this morning's panel, or from our spotlight speakers, David um, and Fatu, do you want to type it quickly in the comment box? Um, I'm happy for us to read out three of them if you type um, quickly in the uh, message box on Zoom. While everybody in the room also notes anything new that comes to mind. Nothing from online? No? Okay. Going 10 second countdown. 10, 9, 8. Has anyone started typing? No. Okay, fine. Right, so let's keep moving. Let's address the elephant in the room. And I know David touched on it a bit, um, but let's address it. So that, because I want us to address it so we can park it, right? Let's state the obvious. The world is facing economic challenges. I get it, you get it. Countries are impacted differently in this current crisis, I get it. And actually, Ghana is probably an example of one of the countries that's suffering more than others. I get it. I'm not pretending that it doesn't exist. It's good to understand facts, as David said, but then you then choose what you do with the um, um, information. But, you know, personally, I believe that one of the reasons why we're probably more acutely impacted than others is that our economy is not resilient. People ask questions about personal resilience. We don't have a resilient economy. And I'll give you a few reasons why. We have a high dependency on a small number of exports that we trade the world with the world with, right? In terms of scale. I'm, I know there are lots of little, little things going on, spices, this, this, this. But in terms of scale that really impact our net natural, uh, uh, you know, our national purse, you have cocoa, you have gold, you have oil, really. That's really, those are the big ticket items. We have, so that's what, what we're able to trade with the world with. So it means that any time there's a, an issue with any of these, we quickly um, struggle. Then we have um, a second issue of resilience, which is we have a population that doesn't support local industry. I, I'm being very blunt here. You know, everybody finds a reason to explain why they don't support Ghanaian businesses. There's always an explanation. But if you don't support them, then there's no resilience in our economy because we're just busy re relying on other people. And th if you don't support them, then no jobs will come <coughs> because they're the people who are going to employ people. We're not the only ones struggling right now, but we're probably one of the few where analysts can actually say we gave up on the country and the currency before someone else did. Mindset. Mindset. Yes, there is the issue of you know, probably having leaders who are not fully transparent with us to tell us the facts of the matter, of what we need to do to make different and pretend that there's Santa Claus and they can fix everything. I get it. But the solutions we need to build a resilient economy are going to require you and I to do the work. Take the action and actually do the work. It's not going to happen just because 
you know, I took a mic and you took a mic and we asked each other a few questions, we got a few responses. And as I talk about in the book, The Bold New Normal, I talk about the story of um, Singapore, where I learned about what it really took to build the Singapore that we know and love. They had to work. An entire generation dedicated themselves to building it. This same Singapore that apparently at independence we were the same as, is now regarded as a first world hub and you and I are here. So today, this elephant in the room that is no longer an elephant because we've talked about it, we need to use it as a rallying cry. We need to use it as a burning platform that rallies all of us around the need to take action. This is not the first time that we faced a challenging situation. Can we make this the time that we actually translate it you know, again, in the book, I talk about 1983, coming to Ghana, no rainfall, hunger. There wasn't even food. It's not that we didn't have money. Even if you had the small money you had, you couldn't even find food to buy. But shouldn't we have learned the lesson? How long ago was 1983? And we can give countless examples. But the question is, are we learning? Or are we going to go through this situation that we went through um, the pandemic? I thought that would be a big turning point. And we quickly backslid. We're going through another crisis, and it looks like we, we, we would rather complain our way through it. People have responsibilities. I'm not here to talk about somebody else's responsibility. We are here to work on our responsibility. So let's not spend time on what someone else is going to do or how someone else is going to build their new, bold new normal. Let's spend today on me, on you, on how we are going to create our bold new normal. And I know you are in agreement, because if you wouldn't, weren't in agreement, you wouldn't be here. There's no point being here if you're not in agreement. So you're in agreement. Are you in agreement? Yes. <laughs> You want to realize your potential. You, you, you feel inside of you that you have so much more to give, so much more to offer. So instead of just feeling it, instead of just talking about it, I want you to write it. Today, we're not just going to take, you've taken notes all morning. Now you're going to write the notes for you. The notes that will say, when I leave this room, I'm going to do A, B, C, D. Even if you end up with what we call a straw man or you know, an, a, a light version, it has to be something that's actionable. So we can't get away from the fact that you live in the context, you and I live in the context of a country. And I feel as though if we don't address that context of how you feel about the country and how I feel about the country, then very soon you step out of here with your action plan and you'll be like, oh yeah, but it's still the same. <laughs> you know, she sounded nice, but Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the deal. Do we have our five balls back? Or we've lost them? Or you want to okay, three people have the balls, so the three people who have, throw them to someone else. Actually, throw them across. Oh, you want to catch it? Okay, you catch. Can someone catch here? Catch. Another catch here. Do you have two more balls or one more? I think we, how many? Do you have more than three? Okay, we'll pass the balls around. Tell me something positive about Ghana. Sorry? Yes, you've got the ball. Tell us your name and tell me something positive about Ghana. Hi, everyone. I'm Esther Kachu. I think. Hi, everyone. I'm Esther Kachu. I think one positive thing about Ghana is that we have the people, we have the women, we have the men, and we are very young and bright. Thank you. Who well, has the ball here? Okay. Tell me one positive thing about Ghana. One positive, one positive thing about Ghana. Resources that, that could take us to the top. So you love that about Ghana? Yes. Okay, excellent. 
Um, who has the ball? Oh, yes. You're, you're Mr. Ya in Master Ado, aren't you? So this is one of Inshirado's children who are here to create their Boldy Normal. Go ahead, tell me. Tell me one positive thing about Ghana. There are people who make you Sorry. There are people who make you I love, love that. <laughs> this, this guy, he needs a contract with you because he's found our food. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can I have the ball? Thank you. I'm going to ask two more people and, and people online. I want, please write in the comments one positive thing about Ghana. And if you're not Ghanaian, you can write about another country. I want to hear one positive thing about your country. One positive thing that you love about Ghana. One thing I love about Ghana is that the uh, industry is green in the sense that there yeah, are a lot of stuff that have not been done here in Ghana. So if you have an idea that you want to do, it's a very good ground to take the action, that board decision, and make it happen. Excellent, excellent. Let me grab this bag. <laughs> okay, that was my bad. My bad. Are you ready for one virtual question? Yes. Um, I like that Ghanaians have a fantastic sense of humor. Excellent. I love it. You know, and, and why aren't we selling our comedy then? Because they're right. I mean, G, G, I'm not going to go into detail now. If you go and l learn the story of Ghana Twitter, how we uniquely, our, our, our unique sense of humor engaged Twitter differently for Twitter to behave differently in Ghana is amazing. Why, why aren't we packaging that? Okay, one thing you love about Ghana. Excellent. Us on the map. It is putting us on the map. Okay, one more. I'll take the, this ball. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Estella, you go. Since we both talked about Estella Hutchfo and um, everything in our country grows. Like every part of the soil, something grows there, which is quite amazing. And we're hungry. <laughs> we shouldn't. Let me give him the ball. We shouldn't be. We, there's no, we have no excuse to be hungry. Okay, so one more person. So, okay, my skills. Actually, you've been very quiet. Are you writing these things down or you're just listening, audience? Da, da, da. Write it all. For every time someone tells you something negative about Ghana, you have to be able to tell them something to counter that. Can we have one here? And do you have anyone else online? So, um, because I wanted to end the right to talk, I actually caught the ball myself. <laughs> okay, so one thing I love about, about Ghana is that generally it's safe. If you look at world over and the uh, insecurity and the crime rate in other countries, unless of course we are not able to record it here, but otherwise Ghana is generally a very safe haven. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please slap for me. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> So I want to read a little bit from page 100, sorry, page 100, something I wrote in the book about Ghana. Um, on page 100, um, somewhere in the middle of the page, if you have a copy, and it says, um, and in particular, I celebrate Ghana. So the prelude to this was I'd been talking about um, independence, 60 years, and what we'd done. I said, and in particular, I celebrate Ghana. She is the leader, the beacon nation of a continent, inspiring me to pay homage by leading to. That leadership means responsibility, a responsibility to show the way, to show that her age will not deter her people from working together to move forward, to give up complaints and roll up sleeves to work diligently. Diligent work to weave together a masterpiece of a nation. We need to write it to, to, to create that masterpiece. And this is a short ode to Ghana. So I want you to write two to three sentences in your own words. I'm not going to call on you to share, so don't worry. But write your own, you know, what she means to you. And like I said, if you're not from Ghana, then write about your country. But what does... What, what is the sort of your hope, your aspiration, what you love about her? What do you love about Ghana? Just, 
Just a moment. What do you love? Just write what you love. And, you, and if you do feel so inclined to share, then I'm happy for uh, a couple of people to share, especially online. Online, we really want to hear from you. Your ode to Ghana. What you love about her, something positive. Okay, well, we have um, something positive about Ghana. One positive thing about Ghana is that we have warm and friendly people. Ghana Jolof is the best. <laughs> Ghanaians are hardworking and dedicated individuals that can be channeled into positivity. I like how laid back and chilled Ghanaians are. Thank you. Patrine, can she have a mic, please? We have the sun, summer all year. <laughs> Thank you. So who has written a verse, a paragraph, two sentences, three sentences about their love of Ghana? You know, it's almost like you're writing you know, a love, you know, love, love note to Ghana. So these are the reasons why I love you. There's a hand up over there. We have two, two gentlemen ready with their love notes to Ghana. Oh, and three. And three. What I do love about Ghana is that um, it's possible to network with people to achieve a goal um, because they are really excited about what you want to achieve if it's something they are interested in. Okay, excellent, thank you. Who's written it, like the way it's written in the book, like a, an ode and, you know... Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Asante. So, I'm talking about Ama Ghana. I love you because you are the center of the world. Mm -hmm. The green with meridian latitude zero and longitude zero. Ooh. Because of you, the world has a reference of scale of time. You are a country of more than half of your population being young people. Young people stand for energy, they can stand for greens. And I love you because you are the beacon of art. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> because we do not feel shy to console people who are hurt. Aww. That's right. We have, one, we have one lady here. Okay, that lady and that lady, and then we'll, we'll carry on. Thank you. My name is Rhoda Drewaje Kumso. I put this down for Ghana. Our patriotism to bounce back, even after a fall or a downturn. We always rise up from colonial days to post-independence, to our coups, to the new Fourth Republic, to our love for football, even when we are despair and we think we will never support our best black stars, mm -hmm. we always bounce back to be that for <laughs> The lady in red. So I put this down. My name is Winifred. Hi, Winifred. Ghana, her people's ability to rise above any challenge and force forward. Never being deterred by past failures, you constantly rise above and make things happen. Seen as a beacon of hope on her continent, her people are amazing managers who make magic happen, even in scarcity. Thank you. Okay, so we've talked about our love of Ghana, and the truth of the matter is that for every complaint that we hear or we repeat, we, de we do love Ghana. And it's about time that we spent more time talking about what we love about her than the things we don't. We can't be the ones who immediately jump to vilify her when we're supposed to be the ones most in love with her. And that's a commitment that we need to make to each other, but most importantly to ourselves. You know, the same way that I'd like to think that if someone knows you well and she, the person is in a room and someone is saying something about them, they'd say, oh no, but you can't say that about her. We should be able to also say the same about Ghana. When pe when it even to our fellow Ghanaians, we should be able to pivot the conversation. So 
in and you know on page 105 that on the very last is a paragraph something that that I, 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 I captured there was is that um, and it's in the context of what you know, our mindset and what we do for Ghana and I say that you know what we think say and do will always it will count for more we are the system that drives the country so when we talk about our country, we can't talk about it as if we're removed from it. The love that you feel is also because you're connected. And remember that if on this entire planet, this is a country that God gave you, then the least you can do is love it. It's the very least, right? So... We've talked about Ghana, and we've talked about how much in love we are with her. So now I'm going to ask you each to be in small groups, a group, actually only four groups. This group is kind of small, so if anybody wants to join them to help them in their numbers, then please do. But we're going to form just four groups, and in each of the groups, you're going to have just a few minutes. So let me capture my time here. So I'm going to give you seven minutes as a group to discuss the challenge I give you. And then you're going to go back to, well, if you're, so wherever you're sitting with your group, you'll stay there. And when you finish um, I, um, I'm talking about your idea, seven minutes, so I'll time you. You then each have five minutes. So you choose one or two representatives of the group, only five minutes to talk about what you have. Um, and then after we've gone through around in the room, everyone online, choose any of the, the challenges I put out there. Um, but I will then give you some time to also um, share your feedback. So I don't know whether you can, they can do it through raising hands and coming on the screen or whether they need to type it. But that's seven minutes to ideate, five minutes per group to share your feedback. And then I'll, I'll go on online for a few minutes. So. The challenge is around, does anyone want to move here? Okay, go and help the Slim Pickings crew. We missed a question. We missed a question. I missed a question. I'll come back. Anyone else joining there? Make sure you have your notebooks. This session is notebook, notebook, notebook. You know, I tell people all the time, I don't go into a meeting without a notebook. I don't care whether there's a board meeting or what meeting or what me I never pretend that, pretend that I will remember everything. Twitter. Um, oh, and, and I've just been reminded, please keep tweeting. Hashtag the bold new normal. Anything that you're learning, put it out there. If you're capturing any photos as well, send them out. Um, so are we settled? Okay, good. So... I'm going to read the challenges, and then I'm going to start um, timing you. So the challenge I have for this group is that we've talked a bit about healthcare from a very scientific point of view of you know, creating a genome database and for treating um, specialized healthcare needs. But I want you to spend seven minutes thinking about how do we make healthcare accessible to every Ghanaian. Ordinary Ghanaian, how do they get access to decent healthcare? Not the one where when they should be given an IV, the, doc the person gives them a paracetamol because they can't help them. How do we create access for everyone to good quality healthcare? So think about th that, and I looked around, I, I wouldn't give you the question if Yao was here, but Yao's not sitting here, so. Yeah, no, 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 that's... <laughs> All right, so that's yours. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'm going to switch over to this group. You know, one of the things people talk about a lot every time, and it came up today, people go, oh, but you people, you're talking because uh, you have this education and you've done blah, blah, blah. How do you, we make high-quality education accessible to every Ghanaian child? High quality, so the kind of education that really informs them, teaches them how to think, how to really, um, you know, engage the world, you know, idea, you just be the best of themselves. How do we do it? So that's education. So healthcare education. This group, and you don't have Julie, so no Apple. <laughs> how do we feed every Ghanaian? 
food is basic, a basic need. How do we feed everybody? Right? Oh, this one, she shouldn't be here. <laughs> but I'll make the question hard, so she still, still has to work hard. So, again, we've learned the baseline from a fashion point of view, hearing from our participants this morning. What I want you to think about, because you raised it, it was you who raised the challenge of, I think, quality or cost or something. How do we really grow our, our fashion industry? It's, it's a vehicle for projecting our authentic selves. It's a vehicle of um, engagement, telling our story. But how do we really scale it up so that some of the ideas, like David said, about exporting abroad, how do we make it? You know, I told you we have one, two, three. Uh, main dependence. How does fashion become a core industry and sector that's providing jobs? Ghanaians are using it. We can afford it. We can export it. What, what, what would you do? So that's yours. So I'll leave you to it. Okay, so I'm starting my seven-minute timer now. Now, for the people online, pick any of the, you guys, Karen, pick any of the four um, and, and ideate. If there's someone you can quickly call, you can WhatsApp, you can connect with, then please do so. But pick any of the four, come up with your ideas, um, and then I'd love to hear from you. So, accessible healthcare, accessible quality education, how do we feed ourselves, and how do we make um, fashion a core industry that really contributes to our economy? And I only have one rule. The answer cannot be what somebody else should do. That cannot be included in the answers. Yes. So things that you think are actionable. Yes, actionable.
three minutes to go. Two minutes more. So your time is up, time to wrap. Time is up. I love the way you're enjoying solving for Ghana. Okay, time's up. Can you select the two, one or two people in your group who are going to present the solutions? Can you select the one or two people who are going to present your solution, please? Right, time to present your solutions. Let's all turn around. And as different groups are presenting, capture the notes because look, we're, we're, we're engaging the business of being the solution to Ghana because we love her and we believe that we can do better.
for her in doing better for ourselves. Okay, we have a very animated healthcare group here. Okay, healthcare people, please select your presenters. <laughs> You've got your presenters. Okay, excellent. All right, so we've got our presenters. Fashion, we need your two presenters. Time, time to turn around. <laughs> Team fashion, we need, to, we need to turn around and hear from you. So let's get going. Time's up, time's up. Isn't it just great to solve problems, at least capture solutions? But now we need to hear you. We need to hear from you. So please turn around. Time's up. All right. So, shh. Time to hear responses. Team education. Sorry, yes, you are team education. Team education. And please capture notes from each other. Guys, please pay attention. Please pay attention here. Order, order in the house. Time's up. All right, team healthcare, please turn around. Team healthcare, thank you. Thank you, team healthcare. And I hope those of you online have written down your solutions and will come to you shortly. So, team healthcare, who's presenting? Somebody needs a mic here. Hello, testing mic one, two, two. Team healthcare is right behind you. Oh, sorry, I mean team education. I was talking about team education. Team education, who has the mic? Let's pay attention. You have five minutes to tell us what you think, need, you know, how we can solve for education. Okay, the mic Hi. isn't working. Okay, good. We've got you. Okay, so we had a discussion, quite short, but we were able to put down a number of things. So we understood that in China and some other developed countries, they actually teach their children in their languages. So it's been a me thing and what we can do, we can start from our homes. So parents teaching or translating some of the English things in the languages that they best understand. And then we also talked about mentoring. So your village, your community, you can be picking up maybe some senior high or junior high school students and explaining some things to them about their career, what they can do, their personality, trying to understand how they can combine those and um, all the factors in our life to actually have good education. And then we also talked about the restructuring. So a lot of our education is directed towards theories, a lot of theories, but there are no practical aspects of it. So in our homes, like, um, Next, in electronics or engineering, technology, technology, yes. So certain things in our homes. So for me, my brothers actually do transpiration experiments. We have trees in the house, so they actually practicalize the things that they do from school. So it makes it easier for them to accept and understand what they are doing in a theory, and they know that it's not just something written in a book, but it's actually doable in practice. So that's, I think, a summation of what we discussed. So I love the fact that you fundamentally focused on, especially the home. This is a very important place for making a difference in an individual's life, whether in, in, in terms of creating access for them or even creating the right mindset to engage. Does anyone else have anything to add from the team? We, we do Thank have you. from our virtual audience as well for yeah. education. Okay. Hello. Yes. Excellent. So in our homes, educating people around us, 
Great. There's, we'll take um, some feedback from online, and then if anyone has any questions for education, think about your questions. We'll ask them questions. Right. We have three for education. Okay. To, to make it accessible, we need to develop digital libraries and educational platforms and introduce it to schools across the length and breadth of the country. The second point was we need to build libraries across the whole of Ghana to stimulate creativity, critical thinking skills, and enterprise. These are the things we can do, and it's something I intend to do. And the last point said, setting up skill development centers across the country to train people directly for the local industries. I love those responses, especially the gentleman who said um, it's something he intends to do. I would add on to that what this group came up with, because having the technology and the tools and the means is great, but it's the people that actually make it happen by bringing it to life. You know, just yesterday, I was at the Ghana STEM Network um, Week, GDIW, yeah? Um, and there was a lady there from a company called Asanka, and they go around, they do some of this stuff, they go around to rural areas and engage, and she was t talking about how in many areas when they go, even though they brought the skills in, in, a, in, a, in, a bo um, in a box, so you don't even need to be connected to the internet, sometimes the local communities are refusing to send the kids forward to engage. What we talked about, which she and her team actually do, is that you also have the need to engage the community, be the example, be the voice that actually tells the community of the benefits of tapping into, say, a library or a skills development hub. So we always have to remember that the solution, when, it's, when there isn't a human element to the solution, then it's harder to navigate the change, because ultimately we're asking people to stop doing something and start doing something else? And how do you transition them across? So those are great, great um, um, responses. Does anyone have any questions well, for we this? We have some people on Zoom who've raised their hand. They'd like to ask the question, um, contribute uh, as co well. Contribute as well. Are we ready for to project them? Um, why don't we, because they've raised their hand and we put them on video, why don't we go around the room and then I'll come back to them because they, they probably have different responses. Um, so we'll come back, but if you have any types that are direct, about a particular sector, then please let me know. Okay, team healthcare, you are very eager. And we have some of our youngest, youngest Love participants it. in the conference here. So who's presenting for team healthcare? Our youngest participants. Yes. Woo! Wow. Should I step away so you can see him properly? Tell us your name. My name is Akumapa, and I'm here to present on healthcare. We could make boots for public um, use, maximum four per a neighborhood, and it will have an emergency alert if there's any emergency, where the button will be pressed and a tracker will be sent an alarm to a hospital nearby to alert them of the emergency. And we could it could also be powered by solar electricity or biogas. It'll, there will be recorded manuals of correct procedure to manage the situation which will be available. There could also be first aid and thermometer. If um, in serious emergency, there could be oxygen tanks and inhalers. There could also be bandages and furthermore, a washing, mouthwash and proper personal hygiene product for use. There will also be um, weekend, weekend maintenance to check on it very well. It could be waterproof and bolted to the ground in case of flood. And there could be um, a monthly health care check on the, the community and its environment. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> I, I, I see, I see your colleague. Please do better for me. <laughs> oh, no, you can clap better, please. That's the future of Ghana, right? There. The future of Ghana, right? There. That's really? All wow. That's all him. The future of Ghana, right here. You see, we, we talk about the future and the bold new normal so uh, of, often. So, the same way that I have a responsibility to people like many of you here who are younger than me, you equally, and I too, have a responsibility to people like this. 
you know, we have to make sure that we're creating an environment where they can thrive, right? Because everything that um, Akumapa, right? Akumapa said was practical. It's based on what he knows about his environment. It's not based on someone else's. It's based on what happens in his country, in his local communities. Because some of the things he mentioned, if you tell them to someone else, oh, this is so basic. But he's talking about really primary health care in the, in the communities and how we build those kind of hubs. So I love the ideas. Um, yes, they're still clapping for you. Um, does anybody have any question there? We're actually not done. So oh. Yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, his, his partner in yeah, success. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're talking about inclusive healthcare, right, for everyone. Yes. We started the conversation by breaking down what inclusive healthcare really means and how we want to address it. So we talked about diagnostics, talked about research. We also looked at um, what public health would look like and what education, uh, what role education would play in this. And one of the key things that came up was that we need to begin to optimize diagnostics for Africans, right, because of current information available about maybe malaria is Western, right, as opposed to what information is available for the African countries. Mm -hmm. So we need to begin to make research about Africa and how Africans react to malaria, cancer, and what other diseases are available there so we can begin to have um, resources or materials to educate our people about the African, uh, the, the, how the diseases affect Africa. I think um, Dr. Yao was mentioning that for African, uh, at 25 years you can detect um, uh, stage four cancer as opposed to the, the um, Europeans, right? So that's different mechanism, right? Different data set. So we have to look at that. And I think we, we made mention of which he's spoken about is we have put in first aid boots in our local ecosystems, our local um, our public health spaces, using the community, um, local um, government areas and the likes, just to ensure that healthcare is accessible to all, right? And having um, local language materials that the people in this community can have access to, they can really understand because it's written in their own language, right? Hopefully they can read and write so that this education system is doing better. But yes, if they can do that, then we can create materials in their local languages for them to understand. Um, we also spoke about regulating, regulation for TV, right? Recently we've had these issues around herbal medicine and stuff, you know. We don't know what research they did. We don't have um, the um, regulatory sandbox or framework for that. So we need to begin to build regulations around that. And the um, last point was to say charity begins at home, right? So we need to educate the parents, educate their wards, or educate the wards, educate their parents, one way or the other, so that we can begin to, from the house or from the homes, have um, good education around healthcare in all the spaces. It's all in the home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, the point you made about um, local language is really an, an important one because it's one thing to speak another language, but it's another thing to compre comprehend in the language in which you think. And there's always an assumption that everybody is thinking in English or thinking in the school of the language of instruction, and many people don't. And our ability to translate to the, the way what people are the way people are thinking helps build their understanding. Um, excellent. Do we have anything we on? Do. Uh, okay. With regards to Thank quality you. healthcare for every Ghanaian, trained medical practitioners should be willing to be available to practice in any part of the country to assist with their expertise to help those who can't afford the best healthcare. The practitioners and stakeholders involved who can afford to offer free services should offer that willingly. And then someone says, we can start by living and eating healthily. Um, let our local organic foods be our medicine. I'm a surviving severe stroke patient. I did it myself. Wow. So eat our own and let's spread our healthcare profession. And let's train more healthcare professionals mm -hmm. as well to a high quality standard so they can engage. Okay. Right. So I'm going to come to Team Fashion. Team Fashion, they didn't want to stop. So today they're going to unleash a multi billion dollar industry in this place on fashion. Let me step out the way so you're visible. <laughs> Fashion. So, we are still ideating actually. Okay. <laughs> and um, we put down some few notes. So one was changing mindsets because we realized that we've been socialized in a way to want other goods. 
So changing mindsets about African clothing and creating awareness about African brands. Then under that, socializing our children even from when they are babies to wear Africa so that when they are grown, there's nothing or oh, wear Africa because whatever you are wearing is still African. Then utilizing social media to build demand such that this demand will also build the industries and it will de develop to supply so that it can also gain revenue. Then the second point was knowing our customers. Because if you don't know your customer, you can't market well. When we know our customers, we can categorize our products and services into African wear that's standard for the house, premium for let's say work or any other function. So that we have we are covering all the customers, the customer bases that we have. Then three, doing our research on costs, such that we collaborate and aggregate the products, just like Mr. Levy said early on, so that we can also benefit from large economies of scale. That's for costs. Then the fourth one, packaging and marketing our products well. So it's a whole value chain, and then we can't just tackle one aspect and leave it. But once we go through all these things, and then we package and market our products well, then the movements will reach everywhere, and then you will finally be wearing Africa everywhere you go. So I'll, my colleagues will add to it. OK, thank you. So I agree with you, it's a whole value chain. I think what's interesting is that every time we think about African fashion, we only think about detailed print. Where's mine? On this side, right? But you can have African fashion that's not detailed print as well, and vice versa. I remember years ago, and I, I tell the story in the book, going to Dubai and seeing an African print trench coat by one of these big designers. I've forgotten which one it was. I was like, wow. This, the, and, and of course, you know, it wasn't cheap. So what happens is that we, design it, we keep it African, and then once it goes somewhere else, it's not African and it's high price. But we can chop and change and we can mix and match. And it doesn't always have to be, I mean, you find Mr. Smock here, there's some smocks that are very plain fabric. There's Kente that's plain, plain fabric. All I'm saying is that we need to not only identify with the busy print, even though personally, I love the busy prints and I like to choose the colors that I think suit me, I think we, we need to also expand our minds to, it's not just the fabric that makes it African, if you remember the conversation this morning, it's also about the people who make it, the creatives. You know, there, there's some, you know, I find amazing, it's amazing that we don't have an African print that is fully trademarked, mm -hmm. that I know of. If Kente was anywhere else, it'd be trademarked to a point that even if you're going to, look at it, you, you ask for permission, right? Think about it. You, you can't just re recreate the Burberry design anyhow. And it's only a Czech design. It's only, that goes back to Yao's point about, you know, intellectual property and stuff. That people have created these things and we anyhow, anybody is printing. Some people even misname it, uh, blah, blah, blah. So we need to think expansively to your point about the value chain, what makes it an industry, um, how we can get more people to participate. It's not just the designers, but it's the entire thing. Uh, and then uh, I'll point back at um, uh, Wear Ghana, because the, one of the things that struck me about Wear Ghana, and I haven't checked your prices recently, but what I, it's one of the few brands who I feel has been intentional about making quality affordable. Too many people, once they have a name, they have to have a name price. And I ask myself, we talk about we should stop wearing secondhand clothes. How are we going to stop wearing them if we don't make affordable clothes? Right? We need the quality, but that someone has to be thinking about what is the right price point that most people can ac access rather than mine is 5,000. I rest my case there, but thank you for that. Yeah. Do we have anything on fashion? We have a lot of education. Let's okay, see. so we'll come back to that. Yeah. So our last group here, one of our smaller group, might be the smallest on that power, is uh, food. Um, agriculture. And look, let's put, let's put it on the table. This is a country that loves food. Mm -hmm. 
there's a reason why we engage in jollof wars. I mean, it's important, <laughs> right? You can take everything, you can't take our food. But the challenge is, is that so much of our food is not from here. And I heard um, 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 Julie tell the story about food that we import, but I'll tell you a, a personal story for my mother. Um, and my mother tells the story of how we are so anchored on this notion of anything outside of Ghana is better. that she went to the market, and this wo market woman was trying to sell her pepe, common pepe, meko, by telling her that the meko is not from Ghana. Oh, Even the meko seller <laughs> <laughs> wants to tell, tell you that it's good because it's not from Ghana. And she was, she was so annoyed, she told the woman off and she walked away. So, how are we going to feed ourselves, agriculture? Microphone. Oh, yeah, we need a microphone here, please. How do we feed every Ghanaian? Yes. Okay, so if not for the uh, bold new normal conference, we as a group in the past would have um, said Agrit is a collective effort of the government, um, pub, uh, well, private sector, and citizens. But with the mindset over home, we are looking at it from us, what we can do to feed every Ghanaian. So we deliberated and we've come up with the following. Since we, you cannot pour, you and I cannot pour from an empty cup, first of all, we want to start by educating ourselves. So. Um, I know a lot of us have forgotten what agriculture is, so I'll remind you all again, all over again. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is the art and science of cultivating the soil, growing crops, and raising livestock. So in our communities, what are we going to do as individuals? We want to make it loud, campaigns, backyard gardening. We are starting all over again. I love it when one lady said, everything grows anywhere in Ghana. So that's what we are doing. If it's the kontomri you like, I'm not talking about spinach, I'm talking about kontomri. Do it. If the, if the okra started. And with that, we are also saying that as a community, we want to do it together as a community. So if um, my dear lady here is growing okra, I am doing contumery, we are doing butter trade. We are taking it back to the basics. She will give me what she has and I'll give her what she needs. So that's what we want to do. We are going to make it very exciting. We are also saying that um, we are looking at locational um, places that gives advantage to setting um, livestock and setting... Um, uh, crops. So if it's in the north that um, sorghum and millet can grow, then we are going to go there. You can't just, just sit in the south and say you want to feed yourself. Move. Move from the south, go to the north. Go to a farm place, do something. Move to a chimlands, try oil palm, try um, cocoa. Do something because you can't sit in Accra and decide that one person in that farm place is going to feed you. We are feeding ourselves and we are going to move around. Say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> And we are also saying that um, we would want to reduce food waste. My darling, if you are done with the uh, cassava, we are going to do kokonte. So we'll dry the cassava after the fufu, then we'll do kokonte. And we want to run campaigns. You know, Twitter is very heavy. Ghanaian Twitter is interesting. The same way we did with the Jalof Wars, we are going to do the same. So we are going to run campaign. I mean, I mean, those who don't eat certain food, please, do it on train tongue. It's not nice. Try things. To Zafi campaigns, we want to make it as interesting as possible. To Zafi Mondays, or Mutuo Sundays, you know, that kind of thing. And we'll see, watch it, you, you understand, and they'll go back. We're going to do all that. <laughs> so we're saying that we should make it as interesting as possible, and we would explore all these creative ways to um, use the various agri products. Because when we are running these campaigns online, you realize that there's a delicacy specific to certain tribes that you do not even know about. Mm -hmm. If you are driving tribes to, you know, be loud about their local meals, you find out new things that you live in Ghana, but other, uh, like, you know, you never probably would have known. Yes. You know, so these are the things we want to do. And we are saying that we want to put farmers together for organized market fairs or trade. So, you know, farmers is a tomato season. We all know that, you know, just so we don't want their products to go waste and, you know, the transport thing. So we know that when we go to the latter hills or wherever, the plantain fair, we make so much noise about it. We move people from Accra, from the north, and we are doing a plantain fair over there. So we want to have that organized um, farmer market. 
and we, even if it's fruits, we are going to do that as well. And we know that all this would mean that people will talk about funding. So this is from us and not government. We are looking at crowdfunding projects, you know, so that it can support scaling, it can support um, silos, how things are put into better storage and all that. And finally, as a group to feed ourselves, we came up with the hashtag, Feeding Ghana Starts With Me. Thank you very seriously. Twitter, Ghana Twitter power. Mm -hmm. So do we have anything on, on feeding uh, from, from, the, from online? Yes, someone mentioned that uh, let's try as much as possible to also eat what is in season. Um, in the US, we would eat blueberry only when it's in season or strawberries. And when it's more expensive, we focus on other foods. So eat your seasonal food eat in abundance. Season. I've been to Ghana and there's mango season and I go all out during mango season. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, thank you. So before we go fully online, and please bring the online, please put your videos on and raise your hands if you want to ask a question because we're coming to you. Or you, no, actually you want to make a contribution as well. So whether it's a contribution or, or um, you want to ask a question. Now for each group, could you please capture your point on a sheet of paper? Uh, do you have someone else? You're good, yeah? Sorry. Oh yeah, we'll come to that. I just want to make a point. point. So each group, write down what you, capture what you um, um, came up with. One or, it doesn't have to be fancy, but on a piece of paper that you can leave. Because as we said, we're going to think about these ideas more and what, we can, what, what of them we can actually support. It. And I, so you, the, we have a hashtag, feed, hashtag, feeding Ghana starts with, start with me. I love that. Um, online, how are we doing? Can we see them? Can you put your so videos on, raise your hands? Can we hear you? We have some more comments, but it's on healthcare, education. Yeah, go ahead. Let's hear their oh, comments okay. and contributions while we get so people So for healthcare, on. it says, Linda says, expand insurance to cover healthcare costs, invest in community clinics, retooling with basic biomedical equipment required for a clinical setup. And since citation, she says, patients need better education about where they can and should seek care dependent on their systems, symptoms. This requires an understanding of the different services provided at primary care facilities, secondary, tertiary care facilities, and emergency room. Um, we also have another one about education. Again, integrate local language in our teaching curriculum, promote teaching as a respectable career. Mm -hmm. Teaching colleges are stereotyped as the only option for students who don't make it into universities. Education, we can provide affordable and accessible tools like the DEX test. This can be done by setting up competitions for the public to develop easy and affordable tools to use in learning. Excellent, thank you. So I suspect what we're going to have to do with online is that after the person makes a contribution, before someone here speaks, they'll have to re-mute. Otherwise, we might get some feedback, I suspect. So anyway, we have a name, a hand raised. Um, please go ahead. It'll be good to see you if possible, if not, but if not. Please tell us your name and make your contribution. I love the idea, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit on the idea. So, can we mute, please? A little bit on the idea. We still have a bit of a, a, a bit of feedback, but I hope it's not disturbing people too much. So, the the challenge I have with that idea is that we talked about how it's about what we can do. So, if we make an assumption that the facility doesn't c exist in the community then can the said individuals in the diaspora who are willing to do this actually pick a community and set it up? 
and establish their rota of how they're going to engage and, and build as well. Because again, I'm trying to encourage us to keep saying, how do I provide a solution that's within my control um, and, and then other people will come and join me? Because if they start in one community, it's very likely that others will say they'll, they'll take the idea and, and, and start it in, an, in another community as well. It's a good idea. Um, let's go pick a community you're familiar with, where you grew up in Kanishi or uh, your mother's hometown or wherever. Um, start somewhere. Thank you. Any others? So we have a comment um, about education from Baba Ghana. He says, good afternoon, audience um, gathered. About our educational sector, we need restructuring. Let's focus more on TVET and hands-on training, the bold new normal. We need TVET and hands-on training. I think we also need to actually value um, you know, practical skills as well. Um, more. There's a place for everything, different forms of tertiary education, but definitely worth um, placing value on that. Any other comments, any other hands raised, any other videos on? I hope you're all taking notes online and you have your, your virtual notebook with you. We have a hand raised. You know, if you can stay, I wouldn't be leaving right now, not to put you on the spot, because we're now going to write down those action plans after this session. But if, if, if you have to, thank you very much. We had a hand up. Hi, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that. We should be more personable and engaging patients. Thank you. Any other contributions before we wrap with our online and get back to the next section, which is going to be the last section in, in terms of the masterclass delivery, and thereafter we go into our Q&A. Um, is that a new hand up? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Sounds good. Thank you very much for your contribution. Do you have one, um, an, another one? Do, I think, do we have one more hand up? Or is it an old hand up? It's hard to read the names. I, I apologize on the screen, so I can't tell. 
Okay, last hand up, and then we move to our final section um, of the masterclass before our open Q&A. Do we have a hand up? No? Okay, we have a hand up behind me. All right, um, thank you. Um, I'm Elomawiye. So I'd like to make a contribution in regards to um, agriculture. Um, one of the things she said, and made me remember um, something from my childhood, and um, she said, um, it's not spinach, but quantum mm -hmm. rain. And they made me remember watching um, Papa the Sailor Man, um, because every time spinach was aren't watching you, Aren't you too young for Popeye? <laughs> <laughs> I was watching Popeye. <laughs> So you made me remember watching Popeye and how um, after eating spinach, he gave him strength Master. to do yeah. so many other things. And I believe that's a way to um, lift up the brand of our African produce, our own produce, that we can brand them in a certain way that um, it would attract people to get you certain that. Because personally for me, my mom used to bring continue me. I was like, I want to try spinach. I want to try how different it is. It was not better, but I just wanted to try it in a way. So I think that's one way, a way to brand the the things that are grown here, and then advertise them to the world. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. Right, let's move on. Thank you all very much. We, Like I said, please make sure that so your nominated person captures your ideas and, and leaves them written down, because we need to go and think about how we take action on the ideas. But now let's come to you. So we've gone from Ghana. We've come to solutioning for her because we love her. But now we're going to solution for ourselves. So. Time to write your action plan for you. So let's switch back to the book. And let's, let's start from the top of where our action plan matters. Let's start with our visions. Um, so I'm going to read a bit from page 117 into 18. And it's chapter 8, and the title is A New Vision. It's time to recognize a new vision of yourself. It is a privilege to be you. You are not just one of many. It's a privilege to be you because there's only one of you. The circumstances of your birth were not within your control, but what you choose to do with your life is absolutely within your control. So instead of thinking of yourself as being born poor, think of yourself as being born with a whole lot of potential that you have to realize. Your potential is your prosperity. Why does this matter? Because you are uniquely designed to fill a role that no one else can. So, if for any reason you have been left feeling insignificant, I encourage you to boldly reimagine you. Take your strengths and ask yourself, what am I going to do with them? How am I ensuring that I personally embody the bold new normal? We will only make sustainable progress in building a prosperous continent if we get involved, and that includes you. So, we're talking about reimagining, and we're going to start right now. So, I want you to indulge me right where you are and close your eyes. Everyone in the room, online, close your eyes. Breathe deeply and relax. And now I want you to cast your mind back to a time when you felt successful in realizing your potential. Any time at all in your lifetime that you really felt you'd been successful in realizing your potential. What's going on? What do you see in that time? Why do you define it as successful? How were you feeling when you did so? Who 
who's around you, who's with you, but what's happening? What is this time? Observe everything you can see, everything you're feeling in that moment, whatever you did to appreciate the moment, recognize it, celebrate it, whatever it was, just really relive that time when you felt successful. And I want you to take in a few more deep breaths. And now please open your eyes. Now I want you to find someone in this room um, ideally someone you haven't spoken to today, but if you're so gregarious that you've spoken to everybody already, that's okay. <laughs> but find someone you have not spoken to. Um, so go ahead and I'll finish the instructions. And in, I, I, I'm going to give you a 40 seconds to tell the person about the moment and then you swap and do the same. So please find someone. And, and write, write down what you're each talking about so that you can recount it. And if you're online, please do the same. Write down your success moment. grab my notebook. Right. So tell me about a time. I didn't quite catch, capture your name the last time. So. Oh, it's a lovely name.
I think we're good. All right, all right, all right, all right. You've shared your moment with the person next to you. Can you get back to your original seats, please? Time to get back to your seats. Please get back to your seats. And if you didn't write down what you said, guys, let's get back to our seats. Let's, let's um, um, calm down. If you didn't write down or write it down already, write down what your successful moment was and write down the successful moment of the person you worked work with. Please write it down online too, write it down. And if there's anyone online who's willing to share their successful moment, please do raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you. Anyone online willing to share that moment with us? Okay, so while we won't wait for anyone online, do we have anyone in the room who's willing to share their successful moment with us? Yes. Can we have a mic, please? So, when I closed my eyes, I just recalled final year in school. You recalled? Final year in school. Uh huh. And the school, I chose an entrepreneurship project in a group of five. We're trying to tackle poor nutrition for mothers in rural areas. And for me, it was successful because almost unanimously every time, I was chosen to present on behalf of my group. And I was very passionate about what you were doing. I'm still very passionate about it. The interesting twist is that after school, I just did national service, all of us. And then the idea just went somewhere. But it's still a passion of mine. So that was one thing. I excellent, did. excellent. And that moment, is, it's still with you. It's still somewhere in there. It's going to come out. Anyone else? Who else is um, ready to share their success? Akumapa's brother, please remind me of your name. Nkunim. Nkunim. <laughs> oh, wow. Please, um, there was this moment in school where my teacher was sad, and then I found a way to make her laugh, so I was happy. Aww. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anyone else? Successful moment. We have a couple of people in the back. Oh, no, you should get a mic. Can she have a mic, please? OK. So I mentioned earlier when AB and David was presenting that I'm currently in law school. So I studied pharmacy as a first degree. And I realized I wasn't enjoying the whole national service space and everything. And I wanted to go into law, and I had to have an agreement with my parents that I was going to fund it myself. So I had to start working, doing digital marketing here and there. And I went to Mount Crest University, and I realized they had a waiver option, but then it was only available for people below 25, and I was 24. So I applied, I had to write the essay, um, I had to get reference letters from my faculty members from Central Leadership Program. And the day that I was so excited and was one of the moments I, I was looking at when we closed our eyes was when they gave me the letter and I opened and I had been given the waiver. And I, was, I wanted to shout. I was shouting within, but <laughs> <laughs> I just shouted within me. I didn't want them to see that I was so excited, but I, I was just happy about that particular moment. Excellent. Wow. My name is Adele, and my uh, most successful moment so far is kind of in two folds. So I started my service in a, a particular company, a school, and we have certain targets that we have to hit because of um, our partnership and an external partner. And I was put in a one-person department, so there was only one person in that department before I joined, and I was 
explain more of the background if it's that's true. So I would do the uh, filing, the basic manual stuff, and then the big ticket efficient, then everything else was done by my boss. Um, it got to a point where my boss had to leave. And in the middle of when she had to leave, there were still targets that had to be met. And I was the only one that was in that department. And no one would believe me when I said, I legit do not know a lot of the things that were being done in the background. But I had to buckle down and do what needed to be done. And then for the first time since the company's inception, certain targets were met and over met. Um, simultaneously, I was uh, enrolled in the central leadership program at the time. So having to combine uh, a very intensive and vigorous training program with having no clue from my background, um, it was a registrar role and then I studied English and psychology. Vast difference, I genuinely had no idea. But having to work on the job, and it turns out that I also became um, best fellow for my uh, leadership program in that year. <laughs> and it was really, I, I, I was telling the person I spoke with that I'm still living on that high. <laughs> having to be able to hit two very important milestones and achievements all in the same space. And I thought I was losing my mind, but turns out something right came out of that. So. Well done. Thank you. One more person. Anyone else? We have a hand. We have a hand. Okay, we have two hands and three. Uh, you, this one, a man. Yes. So we'll, 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 we have a mic here. Is there a mic here? Oh, there's a mic here. He scrubbed. Okay, go ahead. Well done. Well done. Do we have a gentleman in the smock? Were you going to say something? There's a lady. Can you have a mic? All right, thank you. So I took a job after my national service as a teacher in a private school. And the proprietors, that husband and wife, wanted to give a accessible education to the people in the community. So their fees were quite low. And they had challenges financially. And the teachers then were complaining about their salaries and everything. I got in, I realized that, okay, there needed to be a lot to be done as a teacher. I started and I applied myself the best, and then after a while I was made head teacher, assistant head teacher, sorry. So I thought that there was a lot to be done. The teachers would complain so much, I tell them, okay, if you are on this job, it's because you chose to be on this job. Nobody forced you to be here. Or as long as you remain here, apply yourself the best because whatever you do repeatedly becomes your habit and if you are looking for the best before you start applying yourself the way you want to by the time an opportunity comes you won't be ready so everybody applied themselves they had never had an aggregate six at bc before when i took over so we had an assessment of the students who were ready about to go we thought that some of them in the second year were ready to go through BEC and Excel. So we had to accelerate their promotion. We got to the parents of those uh, students and some of them were not willing to allow them. In fact, one of them took the child away because when we eventually accelerated the promotion of the others, he didn't want the son to go with them, but at the same time, he didn't want that the child would be left behind, so he took the child away. They went through BEC and for the first time, there was an aggregate six from somebody who came from the second year class. And then on, the school had grown in leaps and bounds and they are doing quite well. In fact, I had to move house from where I was because you know we, we got paid very little because the school was not making that much. I had to move very close to the school, be the first to get there to the school and the last to leave because I had to play other roles as secretary, as accountant, and virtually 
everything until I became head teacher of that school and left later on. The school is still trying to school. Thank you. We'll take one more from this lady and then we'll move on. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Aisha. I come from a family of 10. Um, the moment of success for me may sound very basic, but it meant a lot. And that was when I completed SHS. Because at a point in my life, that was the highest goal, that was the highest I wanted to achieve. And after dropping out of school from JHS for four years, being a street girl, hustling, I got the chance to go back to school. And I just didn't graduate. I finished as the best graduating student. The girls prefect. Wow. I've come as far as having a master's degree. And yeah, and currently I'm with Yamachi under the mentorship of um, Dr. Abigail. Wow. Thank you. Wow. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. We have two hands up online. Can we? That's a brilliant, brilliant story. Thank you. Lots of brilliance, lots of success. Right here in Ghana, the same Ghana. All these people, they're succeeding here. Yes, exactly. There's nothing basic there. Lovely story. We have a couple of people. Please go ahead. Hi. Excellent. Found joy. Thank you. I think we have one more hand up, don't we? Yes. yes. And then we have a Q&A. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. We need a bit of volume, though. Yeah, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Please go ahead. I was glad I was able to make such impact in the 
Excellent. Well done. I think I have an indication of one last one online. Yeah, hello. Hi. Yeah, hi, Lucy. Um, yeah, so this normal. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now grab your notebooks and let's get ready. Let's get ready for, for, for writing our, our plan. And I realized that actually when I was telling the fun facts about our panelists, there's one fun fact that I left out. Um, and it's actually about um, Dr. Bidiakum. So in our not too distant, has he left? He's not here. Anyway, I'll still say it anyway. So not too long ago, at the height of the pandemic, or when it was kicking off, I'm sure many of you remember the news um, article about how we had sequenced um, the, the genome of the, of the um, um, COVID virus. Well, Dr. Bediakun was actually one of the team of scientists who actually made that happen as well. So that sequencing was actually done by Ghanaian scientists. It was done in Ghana by Ghanaians. So again, for me, that's a moment I hope he is proud of, and I think it's definitely a fun fact worth sharing. So let's go back to self, and this time you're not going to move. Stay where you are, and, and I, I want you to close your eyes again. One more time. I want you to relax. Take in deep breaths, but really, really relax. No talking, let's just relax. Close your eyes and relax. And I want you to cast your mind into the future. Now, there may be a future date that you already have in mind, or it could be just in future. And in that future, the same way you saw yourself in a successful moment from your past, I want you to see yourself in a future moment. But this time, it's a successful moment that you are creating. You're forming a new vision of what you want in that future, that future point in time. 
think in your mind about what this vision is. Yes, it's visual, but I want you to put words to it. Tell yourself the words of this vision. What is it? If it's a vision that you're already familiar with, then add more detail to the vision. If it's a vision that you're not familiar with, then craft it. Think about it. But think about it in detail. All of your life is important. So which aspect of your life does this vision tie to? Or is it a vision that encapsulates all of your life? Think about it in detail. Look at it in detail. Dwell in it in detail. Feel the moment in detail. That future vision. What does success in that vision really, really, really look like? How does it make you feel? Does this being in this vision, is it happiness, joy, contentment, high-fiving, relief? What's in that, in that vision? If it makes you smile, go ahead and smile. However it makes you feel positively, reflect it. It's taking the vision. It's your vision. It's no one else's. It belongs to you. And if you're online, please do the same. Look at it in every single detail possible. I want you to capture it and hold it. Hold that vision. Taking a few more deep breaths. I'd like you to open your eyes. And now that your eyes are open, I want you to write down at least three sentences that articulate the vision. Write it for yourself three sentences and be very specific. So for instance, if your vision is to climb Kilimanjaro, then the sentence could be, I'm training to climb Kilimanjaro, or I've climbed Kilimanjaro, or it was so exhilarating to climb Kilimanjaro. Let it be a vision of, of, of achievement and success. Whatever it is you saw, articulate it in at least three sentences. You can write more than three, but at least three sentences associated with your vision. This vision is yours to keep, so pay attention and allow yourself to write as much detail as possible, because it's yours. No vision is too big, because it's yours to create. Okay, I see several people are done writing their vision. So let's move on to your mindset associated with this vision. We've talked a lot about mindset today. I'm not going to belabor it, rather I'm going to ask you questions. Is there any mindset you hold today or 
some expressions that you use frequently, some language that you speak, that you think will be counter to this vision that you have. Write them down. Write down maybe three things that you think as a mindset that you've held for a while would be counter to this vision. And as you write each one of those mindsets that you think won't help you, I want you to cross them out. So write it, but then draw a line through it. What mindsets are you parting ways with today? Because your vision is more important and you want your mindset to be aligned to your vision. So you and those mindsets are no longer friends. Again, this is yours to keep. You're not gonna have to read it to anyone unless you want to, but it's important to document it. So write down three mindsets you're parting wa ways with and cross them out, draw a line through them. Maybe something you've heard forever and ever. Maybe something that you've picked up but you're not so sure, sure how you picked it up. Or something you feel that experience has taught you but you know it's not helpful. And after you've drawn a line through the three mindsets you're parting ways with, I want you to write down three mindsets you need to succeed in, your, in the vision that you've written down. What are three things that should be your mindset to help you achieve your vision? Three things. One of the interesting things David talked about today was about how we, we get information, but it's, it's, it's how we choose to interpret or use it, which is driven by a mindset. Right, and Julie talked about the fact that mindset was created by, um, she talked about values and two other things that are in my notebook, so I'll, I'll read them out to remind you. I actually took a lot of notes today. She said it was beliefs, values, and attitudes that created our mindset. What are the three mindsets that you actually need to be successful in your vision? And one thing that struck me recently was with all this going on around the world, when you watch international news and the topic is the USA, every business person who comes on, on TV talks about their belief in American businesses and how they know that they will ride the storm and everything will be fine. Everyone is in the same situation, but it's a different mindset. It's a belief that it will work out. So has everyone captured the three mindsets that they need, the things you're going to start thinking or you think are, are will contribute? We've, we've killed the ones we don't need and we, we're replacing them with ones that we think will actually help us. Three mindsets. And if you, you, you feel you need to refine the mindset just read over it, think about, you know, have you captured it in ways that when you come back to it, you remember what you wrote down? I'd really encourage you to make sure these are things that you'll, you will share with at least one person. It doesn't have to be someone here, but if someone here would be even better, because remember, excuse me, remember here, you met with like-minded people who are here for the same reason. And the reason why I mention m connecting with someone on, on this mindset and vision that you've captured is that the next thing we need to do is think about our action plans. So under action, I want you to write down three completely new things that you need to consistently do to achieve your vision. And they can be simple things. So one thing I've started doing, maybe in the last two years, it's a recent, relatively recent compared to my age, um, is I try to read every morning, which is actually quite difficult to do before you go to work. I try to make time to read every morning. So I find the other end of the day 
um, I'm not able to, and I need fresh information every day. So I try, it's a few minutes, but I try to do so. So write down three things you need to do consistently to achieve your, visit, your vision, sorry. Because this is about taking action. Even a little bit of action every single day, you'll find that in the end, that action has accumulated and made a big impact because you did it consistently. Not when I have time or maybe next week, but it's something that's on my to-do list at a certain frequency and I'll do it consistently. Right? Write those three things down. So as you've thought of three new things, let's face it, doesn't mean that everything you do is not aligned to your, your vision. So write down three things that you currently do that you believe is already aligned to where you're going. There are things that you can keep doing. And so when you do them, you realize, ah, all this time, me cry, I've always been, uh, I've already been in this direction. What are the three things you do today that you feel are already aligned to achieving your vision. So this is all about action, things that you can actually do. Or you, in this time you've been doing, and now you see that those things are actually positively towards the vision that you've articulated. And so you're gonna try and do them more. You're gonna find other people who want to, to do it. Or if it's not something you can do with other people, you're just gonna try and do it more because you're already into it. You're, it's already happening, but the more you do the things that are in the right direction, then you can bring in the new things and build on them. It's all about us being intentional. It's about action. And then under action, the third part under action, I want you to write down three things you do today that you think are completely counter to your vision. Like those three things. So remember earlier on it was mindsets that I said take out. But mindset creates behavior. And so if you're eliminating the mindset, you also have to eliminate the behavior that it brings about. So for instance, I'll give you a very practical example. Um, I choose to be extremely selective about what debates I'll engage in on WhatsApp. Right? It's a very intentional choice. It's not because I have any issue with debates, but I want a debate where we will come up with something that we'll do something about. And I know it's unlikely to happen. It rarely happens. And so I limit it because it's not really getting me to the pur purpose of solving problems. It's just conversation. I could have a conversation any time, but that debate would have robbed me of some time that I could have been doing something else. It's a simple example. But it's about action, where you're intentional. So when the thing comes to you, you've already decided that this thing is not for me. What are three things you do today that you believe are counter to your, your vision? So you're going to stop doing them. under the action section, you've captured three things you need to do consistently, new things, three things you're already doing that you want to do more, of, and three things that you need to stop doing completely. You need to move off your to-do list. You have to fend them off if they come your way.
Now, I want you to reflect on everything that you've written down. You've written your vision that you saw. You've, you've written down mindsets, some of which you need to change, some of which you need to reinforce. And now you've written a section on taking action, which is around thi things you need to do consistently, new things and things that you need to reinforce and things you need to stop. So in that list that you've written, there's some things that you need to stop doing, and there's some things that you need to start doing, and there's some things that you need to reinforce. Now here's the thing. We are human, and we are capable of change. But we're capable of change if we're intentional. Because for the vast majority of us, Every day, we're on autopilot. We're doing things because we've learned to do them. We don't even have to think about doing it. What you've written down as your action plan is going to require you to be intentional. It has to be intentional that you're deliberate, whether it means reminding yourself, having that partner that you met at the Bold New Normal conference, that you got their phone number, you check in on each other, or you choose, so you have to be intentional. You have to hold yourself to account, which means you have to have checkpoints. We don't change because we felt like change or the thought came to mind. We change when we're intentional. When we do it for long enough, it becomes second nature but we have to do it for a period before it becomes second nature. So I want you to write down a date. I want you to commit a date for these changes. We need a date. You know, when I started working in telecom, the first company I worked for, apparently I was nicknamed when, which I wasn't aware of, but apparently in every Every meeting when people said they would do something, I said, when? And they're like, ah, this woman cry every day, when? When we said we'll do it. <laughs> you and I know that doesn't work. Give me a when. Write down a when that you will commit to. Because remember, every single day, not only do you have a finite amount of time, you have a finite amount of energy. That's why at some point in the day, we get tired and we go to bed. If we didn't run out of energy, we'd be on 24 hours. But you try 24 hours for two or three days. It would, you wouldn't even last, right? So that's why we have to be intentional so that within that 24 hour period, the amount of energy we have, a lot of it is going towards the things that we really want to achieve, even if it's a little bit, even if it's one hour of energy, whatever it is, because the same energy you can spend it chatting the whole evening. It's possible. You still get tired and sleep. That one is guaranteed. It will finish. You need to go and recharge the battery. So write down a date when you want to start your changes. And even if along the way you fail on a change, it doesn't mean that you give up. You retrace your steps and you get back on track. But write down a date. And decide in your mind who are you going to share this plan with? Is the person in this room, you've met them already, or is it going to be someone else? Remember, the person in this room equally has a plan, so you'll be able to support each other. Someone else, you might have to educate on the plan, but if you pick someone from this room, you'll be able to check on each other. And that person can become your bold new normal success partner on how you actually achieve what you want to achieve. But just like I said this morning, it's time. It's, it's really time to create your bold new normal. You've seen from your success stories that you're already doing and achieving many things that perhaps you even haven't, haven't taken the moment to recognize that I did that. You know, we talk, I can, I can give you all the myriad of things. You prayed, you did, yes, all that happened, but it happened to you. Now, you need to project that into the future, but you have to tailor it to an intentional vision and work towards it. And that shift in mindset and shift in daily habits 
are what are really going to get you there more than anything else. Not waiting for the three month window, the day that you take, choose that on this particular day, this 30 minutes is dedicated to that, or this one hour that I can spare, or maybe it's 20 minutes, but it's within your hands. Okay, we have one person writing. No, go ahead, finish writing. You're done. I hope you like your action plan because I already like it. I've been looking at all of you as you've been writing with intent. You're being very intentional about it. And so that's the end of our master class. But it's not the end of our day because I don't want anyone to go home with a desperate burning question they really wanted to ask and they didn't get the opportunity to. But first of all, let's recognize each other for what a day we've had so far and the amazing work that you've done. <laughs> yes, some high fives, some high fives. <laughs> well done, 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 well done. Come on. Thank you. That was phenomenal, guys. I, do you agree with me? That was phenomenal. <laughs> I know we got to dig, dig deep, and I hope that you take those notes and just use it to, to really curate the life you desire. So, I mean, I know we've had some questions already, but we'll, we'll make a few minutes to take a few more questions. Yeah. So, if you do have um, some questions, please show by hand to the gentleman over there. Thank you. Thank you. And online too can queue their questions. Yeah. My name is Achiba. Lucy, thank you so much for this conference. Okay. I think it's been informative and it's been concise. I really learned a lot. But I, I have a question. Yes. The question is uh, how are you putting people together, like the resource we had today, present to us their various experiences in their business? You know the Ghanaian education system. Go to JHS, go to private, go to JHS, go to the university, do national service. If you get a job that is related to what you studied in school, you do it. If you don't get it and you get another job, you, you flow. Mm. Um, the mindset thing that you're talking about, I believe when we get to them, maybe at class six, JHS one, class five, um, we will have as a targeted crop of children who um, these resources deliberately, since you are saying we should be intentional, mm -hmm. looking at the Africa we want to build, mm -hmm. um, going to them, monitoring them, giving them the books to read, leading them to the right books to read, helping them out with their questions and sorting out their confusions and all. At that tender age, I want to find out if you have a vision for, for that. I want to find out how you are going to go about, about that. I do have a vision, and it's called you. <laughs> you know, we were very intentional about the setup of this room, right? You know, when you go to conferences, there's a podium, there's some people there, and there's some people sitting back. And we, we wanted to create an environment that it was all of us together, solutioning together not some people just to giving you a speech and then you take your bag and you go home. And I smile and I say you because all of us together simply means that while I need to do my part, so I'm not pushing back on your question at all, you have a role to play as well, right? Because we just talked about energy and time. If every school in Ghana waits for me, it won't happen, you know that. There's no way one individual can create the change we need to see, no matter how brilliant they are, no matter how passionate, well-intentioned, whatever, give all the nice words. We will only see change if enough of us are driving the change. So I completely agree with you that we do need to engage the children more. We need to go to school. In fact, when, when I was at Airtel, one of the things that we did a lot, personally going to school, I went back to the the school where I did my national service and adopted them as a cluster of schools. 
um, and we adopted another one, La, La, La Wireless. It's important that we engage them. And actually, I had a similar session. Now that you say, I remember we had a session where we talked about vision. This was a long time ago, and they were about the age that you're talking about. So I encourage you, as you practice the formation of your, you know, your action plans and your intentionality, spread it to someone else. You, you may have the time to go to school, but you may not. The fact that you don't have the time to go and dedicate to a school doesn't mean that there aren't children in your life or other people in your life that you can use to, use to influence and say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And as we each do it within our sphere of influence, we'll change our country. Thank you. Thank you. I remember Lebanese name because I've met, today's our third or fourth time meeting. So now the name is unusual and I can't forget it. Good question. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Um, um, that was very bold. Because we'd said repeatedly that was full. My definition of bold is jumping in and figuring it out. It's, it's the maddest thing, and I keep doing it and keep saying to myself, I'll never do it again. <laughs> um, but I'll do it again. I know myself. So repeatedly, I can tell you, I was telling you when we did our one-on-one, -on -one, she asked me about the success moment. Um, even though I'd written down in, in the past that I'd love to write a book, my dad had said one day she'd write a book, I found writing a book such a scary thing to do. Because the more I wrote, the more I wrote authentically and honestly, I thought, oh my goodness, some people are not gonna like this. You think about all the things that could go wrong. Um, and it's going to be out there. Everyone's going to read it. Like, they haven't even met me, and they get to read it. And I did have support. The publisher was very supportive, probably in Ghana. But then I thought to myself, actually, Lucy, if you write a book and it doesn't work out, you'd have gone through the process of writing a book, learned how to learn it, and if no one reads it, at least you will know how, what it feels like to write a book. Um, you know, maybe don't, nobody wants to read your book, <laughs> but more importantly, um, you, the, the, what is the worst that can really happen? The worst that can happen is nobody reads it. That's the only thing that can happen. Nothing will happen to me personally. And so that's how my mind works. You dive in. You know, I feel as though if another human being, wh wherever they are from on the planet, has been able to do something, with enough determination, you know, uh, focus, I can do it. I'm not trying to claim that I've done everything in the world, right? But if someone has done something, it was a human being who did it. They haven't got horns, they haven't got anything. They're a human being like me. So I thought I'd go ahead. So that, you know, that's the same thing with this conference. You know, this, this year, when the year started and I felt that we, should, we really need, this was the year, and this was before any of the current hardship. The start of the year, I told a few people and I was like, I really, I'm really feeling it in me that this is the year that we need to translate this into a conference. But the whole time thinking, but you, you haven't organized a conference before. So why are you doing this, this thing? Of course, then you find the right resources, organizers, plans, but you still haven't done a conference before. How are you gonna land this idea? And then you go and do your homework. So I tend to go with the conviction that 
it's bo something is, is, is bold, it's big, it's bigger than me, and we should do it. And for that reason, we'll figure out how to do it, which is why I believe that we can figure out how to feed ourselves. We can figure it out. We can figure out to make, how to make sure every child gets a good education. We can figure out healthcare. It's not that complicated. It's desire, it's willingness to be scared and still do it anyway, right? As for the normal day-to-day run-of-the-things, run-of-the-mill things, yes, we can do them, but we want a different Africa. Think about it. Where some countries were the day I was born, we haven't reached there, and I'm middle-aged. Think, put it into perspective. If we're not intentional, the next generation of kids will be born and we'll still be here, and people will be going and leaving us. So do it anyway. The worst thing that will happen is it doesn't work out. Then you go and do something else and try something else. And eventually, the right thing will work out. <laughs> Any questions? We have a hand up online as well. Oh, OK. Please, I'm Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Yes, first of all, I would like First of all, I'd like to congratulate everyone here for making this forum available to all of us. And by chance, I found myself here. And I really enjoyed every bit of this conference. It has really inspired me. And most of the nuisance here resonates with my way of thinking and my goals and the things I want to achieve. And I want to say a very big thank you, thank you to all of you. And I'm going out there going to rearrange myself and restructure my mindset and make it happen. Yes, I have wild dreams and I would want to make it happen, just like yourself. And also, please, I have one question to ask you. Um, please, what is your personalized winning recipe? Um, so the baseline for winning is mindset. That's number one. You've got to decide in your mind whether you're a winner or not. That's fundamental. Then beyond that mindset, then you have to decide what do you want to win at? Like, what is it that you're picking as a thing you want to pursue and achieve? And that is, runs the entire gamut, the entire, entire gamut. Um, but when you pick the things you want to be successful at, you have to be willing to do the work. So I'll give you two examples. Um, over the years, I've always had this thing where, yeah, I do, yeah, I do a decent amount of Bible reading, follow up, follow through. Yes, every day a devotional and everything. But I always used to think to myself, so my entire life, I've never read this book fully. Like, I, I just haven't read the whole thing, which I believe I should. Um, so I, I felt it was possible. The people who have read all have not grown horns. Um, <laughs> so I decided that, you know, but I needed the right person. I didn't know who. I had no idea who the right person was going to be. Um, so I added it to my prayer list. I'm like, you know, I, I know I want to do this. I don't know how to do it. That's the thing. Even though I want to achieve the thing, I don't even know how you do it. How do you do it? Like, do you just open it and start just reading? I don't know. And I be, besides, I tried the just reading thing before, and it didn't work. So I knew that was not the right formula. If one formula doesn't work, you find another. Um, and somehow, you know, to this day, I didn't, don't even know how we, we, we connected on this. I must have asked her or something, but there's a lady I know. I'd known her for, for years and years ago, um, and then we, through a friend, and then we reconnected at our church, but then I hadn't seen her in COVID and everything. We live in different countries. Um, and somehow we, 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 we got talking, and she has consistently been, and, and I remember the first year we started, it was 2020, um, and they had already started, and I, I said, you know what, I'll join you so that I learn how to do it, even though most of the year is gone, so by the time we get to next year, I'll know what to do, right? 
Um, was it? Yeah, it was 2020. I don't think it was 2019. But thankfully, we still we did part of that year. We did the whole of the subsequent year, and we're doing another year. So now I have a partner with whom I know this thing I want to keep doing, I'm able to do. Because I feel it's important to me personally and my growth. It's a choice I've made, right? So there's the mindset, there's a focus on what you want to do, there's a finding the right partners to work with, but there's also the commitment. Because she introduced me to a plan that allows you to do a little bit every day. But it's organized in a way that it makes sense. That it's picked, someone has taken the time to pick so that it makes sense for me. I'll give you a, a second example, and I'll give it to you from the workplace. So um, when I was early in my telecom career, I decided that I wanted to become a telecom CEO. Um, and um, I know, it's like, <laughs> why are you thinking about this? Because no one else is. But that's the thing, the more someone else hasn't done it, the more likely I'm going to think I should do it. And you should all think the same way, do it. You don't have to wait for somebody else. Um, so I went to my boss, and, and the way I, I think about those kind of um, um, goals is that I think about where I am today, where I, that, that vision, like the visions you did today, but I also do a gap analysis. What's the gap between Lucy today and Lucy of that vision? So that I'll do the work for her. So when she gets to that vision, she's ready, she's in it, right? So I went to my boss and I said to him, um, this is what I wanted to do, he listened. Um, and he explained to me very clearly, at the time I was doing a, a strategic role, a more strategic, and he said, no, you can't run a company if you've never generated money. Like, no one gives their company to you without guarantees that you can make their money. And so what that then meant was a number of years that for, my goal was to, to, from the time of the conversation, to achieve it in five years. I thought, if I give myself five years, I can do, learn all the things. Um, and to get to the end of the story quickly, it didn't, get to, it didn't take five years, it took six. But it, it, we create visions, it doesn't mean it will land. I had another vision for a 15 year plan, it happened in 14. So different things, it'll be there or thereabout most of the time. But anyway, to your point about what did it take, um, so in the end I got sent on a role, and the first role I got sent on was in um, Ashanti region. I got sent to go and work in Kumasi, I should leave Ak Accra. And you, know, you might have heard me talk about this if you tuned into Happy FM um, um, in the week. And so the business was struggling from middle Ashanti upwards. It hadn't really crowded a strategy that worked for that half of Ghana. And I was asked to go and run this business there to make money, essentially. And, oh my goodness, my fellow Ghanaians. <laughs> Why would they do this to you? They're sending you from here. You come from Abuchi. They're sending you from here to there. These people, they don't respect you. Um, all kinds of... Somebody even came and sat next to me. She actually sat next to me and went, you know, hmm, I know you're ambitious and everything. That's for this one. I won't do it. Right? So you also have to have a mindset that says, remember the things I said you need to take away, throw away. Some of them, you even hear them after you've canceled it out. You have to determine that, okay, I hear you, thank you very much. Right? And I went along with it, and it was hard. It was hard because my kids were very young, two of them are sitting behind me, and I had to go away to Kumasi every week and come back at the weekend. And you know, thankfully, I embraced the family around me that, su that supported me. But then, you know, I discovered Ghana in a way that I never knew was possible. I was going to Yendi, Salaga, Osei Kojo Kumbunsu, Kwanta Shishite, Shiriosu, Bogata. Because the business, you need to be on the, on the ground, right? And then that job and then other jobs got sent to DRC. So all the other jobs, which are hard, some of them are really hard work. But I stayed focused on that vision and I ignored the noise of the people who were saying that I'd been disrespected. It, seriously, they said I'd been disrespected. And you keep going because you're going to have that here. You know, you, even the thing that we say in Ghana, ah, but it's papa dear. How are you going to be successful if you're not committed to the work that you're doing, whether it's your own business or someone else's business? And one thing my mom always used to say to us is that if you can't look after that which belongs to someone else, you're not going to be able to look after your own. It's not going to happen. So stay committed. When someone says to you, 
the work is not for your father, so don't put so much. They're on a different path. Let them stay on their path and you stay on your path. I hope that helps. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Lucy, um, again for organizing this. Listening to you, I'm tempted to think that it's been a little rosy for you in terms of the decisions that you have made. I just want to find out, have you made any decision that didn't work? Have you failed at anything? And what was your reaction? What did you do? What, how did you bounce back? My reaction depends on um, um, time of life. Um, so yesterday, my little girl behind me, she was, she was, uh, she was laughing and she said, as for you, you're such a crybaby. I'm like, what? <laughs> the truth of the matter is that the younger I was, the more I'd cry about, about failing. And there were times when I would fail at work and I'd cry the whole weekend. The whole weekend is over. The weekend is destroyed because something happened last week. Um, and as you grow and you learn and you go through challenges, you become stronger. And the things that used to get you down, they don't any longer. You're more pragmatic. You think about it, you reflect, and you move on, right? But that's why we need to deal with challenges. Because in dealing with a challenge, it helps you, um, it, it helps you develop the skills required to navigate the challenge successfully. If you avoid it, that same challenge will meet you elsewhere. Um, so I've had, I've had several instances where I, I felt that this has been a complete failure. Um, I have had times, for instance, where I've, I have managed a team um, and they've been, some of them have been quite unhappy. And anyone who knows me well knows that I really care about how people feel. I want people to be successful, but I actually want them to feel, feel um, um, good about themselves. And so I, I, I always like to understand the root cause of the failure. That might be the engineer in me. Um, and I found ways in this particular instance to navigate understanding why people felt the way they felt without making them feel like I was pointing a finger or that there was a risk to it. And I realized that there were a number of issues that they felt hadn't been resolved. Some of it was it happened before even they came to work in my team, but that's not the point. The fact that somebody's unhappy from a different era and adds it, it's, it's your job now to address things. And if you haven't addressed it in a way that the people feel that um, it meets their needs, then you have failed. But you can't give up. You can't say, oh, I've tried for six months, or I've tried for one year, you're still complaining, so it's over. You go back to the drawing board and figure out what you need to do and do something different. So doing the different is what, what works. I've also had failures commercially. You know, we launched a product in DRC, and boy, was it a disaster. I tell you this not to, to make it sound you know, like I'm talking. We lost $3 million that month. Seriously, it was just gone. And luckily, I didn't lose my job because maybe I had other credit, but that taught me a lesson that even when you have maybe more senior people or other people who are saying, let's go for it, if you're really convinced, because ultimately I had the responsibility for launching that product. It doesn't, didn't matter what anybody else said. I had the responsibility. Um, and and my, my reaction at some point was also wrong. So, not, so I, I killed the product when I realized it wasn't, it, we were losing money try to, to clean up, and it took us maybe two or three months before the network even recovered. We'd exhausted the network. But then a few months later, we did a presentation, and my boss completely threw me under the bus. It was like he was not there for me. It was like this was all on you, and we were, we were a, a, in front of all the very senior people in the company. Um, but then my boss's boss, who knew me well, empathized. But he did give me some feedback that day, because I, not only had I lost the money, but we had recovered. But that day, I reacted to my boss in ways that I shouldn't have. Now, again, these are m the many years ago. And it was, oh, I was visibly furious. Um, and my boss's boss said to me, you know, Lucy, it, we've had the discussion. But the way you are now, you're going to make more people actually focus more on you than the real issue at hand, right? 
So you can have a failure of you know, response, a, a product, a different layers, but you have to learn from it. Otherwise, you continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. I do the closing remarks, I'm going to give you this because oh. you yeah. are a oh, superstar, super, superstar, moderator MC. You know, Hillary did, uh, Hillary did the book launch as well. So she has been, I think we're too close to each other, the mics, the, those feedback. Hillary has been on the journey from day X. In fact, every, almost everybody I work with, I have a story. So Hillary is, you know, we, we bumped into each other in our, in our neighborhood walking. You think I've forgotten? <laughs> and this woman just stops me, and we just start talking. And here we are. Aww. Congratulations. Thank congrats, you. Thank congrats. you. Thank you. Thank you. So the floor is yours. Yes. Go so we're going we're gonna to wrap. Um, just a few remarks to wrap. Um, first of all, I, I want to say a very big thank you. I mean it when I say if without the sponsors, we couldn't have put this on for free, but we didn't want people to be free, especially this first event. We didn't want the restriction of people not being able to be here because they couldn't afford to. And so I'm so grateful to the, these sponsors. These are people that I wrote to and they said yes, right? So Margins ID Group, thank you. Absa Bank. Woo! 
my very own Blisco. You know, type company made absolutely no qualms. You see all your books, just, they made sure you got your, your things that you need. Um, you have, we have MTN. And we also have the Cosmos Innovation Center. And there are partners that we're going to work with around a future hackathon. So we spent some time with them ideating. They, saw, they helped us ideate around this, but more importantly, the hackathons for the future. And I have to mention my, own, oh, my very own past employer, not very long ago, Airtel Tigo, for providing the streaming um, services. We're very, very grateful. Um, we're very grateful for all these people. This is a wonderful location. All these people brought resources. And sometimes you have to remember that those visions, you may not always feel that you have all the resources necessary to achieve it. Start. Start. Somehow, just yesterday, or was it this morning, someone was telling me a story of various things that she, oh, it was yesterday. I think it was, yesterday was Friday, so it was Thursday. I went to see my friend, new home and so on and, and through and she was just telling me how she's just so proud about some of the things that she's managed to do for herself just by starting she had no idea how she was going to do it but she started so that's um, um my thanks to the sponsors we have an amazing army of volunteers and you've seen many of them today back and forth coming doing things running around literally some of these people i know some of them i'd never met all we had to do is that we needed, we needed volunteers. We have a volunteer who actually flew from London. She arrived last night. Um, she's outside, Jessica. And she was partnering and working with her and flew herself to Ghana for this conference. Um, so people have just come out and just said, you're doing this, we're going to do it with you. And they brought ideas, they've done, you know, all the, everything that you've seen, the, the people have just worked, 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 worked to make today possible. So I'm truly grateful for them because as I say to you, no one person can do anything. We have to learn to partner and work with each other more. Honestly, there are more people who are willing to work with you than you realize. Ask them and they'll do so. Um, our speakers. What our speakers, especially the first panel, represent for me, and I talk about it in the book, it's the generation of Ghanaians who make me feel that it's worth our effort. Right? You know, if you look at my generation of Ghanaians, you find very few people who are like these people. There are very few of us. And I get emotional when I talk about them because these are the people who are going to make sure that when I'm an old woman, Ghana is a dis decent place to live. Because when I'm an old woman, these are going to be the people, the big, the big people as we call them. And if they run a bad shop, then I'm stuffed because as an old woman, I will not have the energy to do anything but whatever they think is, is possible. So we need to keep working with them, but thank you for your tireless commitment and dedication. I know our numbers have dwindled, and I know it hasn't been easy, but keep doing what you're doing, because you have to give the rest of us hope so that we keep supporting the hope, and you keep inspiring other, other young people. You heard from Fatu and David, and, and the thing I love about these people is the fact that they're, they're not only willing to be um, outliers in their own right, but they're willing to share what makes them outliers confidently. We need to stop being afraid of saying who we really are and what has got us here and be willing to challenge the status quo. Challenge and say it has to be done differently and it has to be done better. So I really appreciate them for that. And finally, all of you, wow. You know, you, can you imagine organizing a conference and sitting there going, so anybody come? <laughs> but that's a real thought. It's a real thought, and I'm being honest with you. I said, well, Lord, you said I should do this all. And then you brought the people to help, and you brought the people who will sponsor. So you better bring the people to the room as well. So thank you all so much for being here but not just for attending, but for the fact that we're moving on from here to take the real action. And I'm going to read a book, uh, an excerpt for the book, and then we're done as you take off. 
just referring to my notes really br briefly. Okay. Ultimately, this is page 138. Ultimately, the bold new normal is about creating new visions of Africa, country by country. It's about creating positive mantras to replace diminutive descriptions that undermine positive visions. And I know your visions are positive. New mantras that become langue de jour, everyday language. As our language builds up, our mindsets will become aligned to our visions. An alignment that will invariably alter our actions. For good, I presume. And when we do this, we will boldly own our own voices and confidently tell our own stories. No longer will discussions be held on Africa with no African present. It is these actions that will ultimately produce the bold new normal, creating the Africa where everyone prospers. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was a fantastic way to end this. This was beautiful. We are done for now officially. If you do want to have, ask anyone a question, you can after doing the networking session. And um, we also want to acknowledge, we had someone come all the way from Ahafo, Diana. I don't know if she's still here, but I mean, this was phenomenal. Is she here, Diana? Are you here? Show by hand. Can we put our hands together for her? Thank you so much for coming all the way, all the way. Thank you so much. So yes, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You have been a phenomenal audience. We want to thank our audience in-house and those who stayed with us on Zoom as well. Our people on Twitter, don't, keep, don't stop engaging. Keep tweeting the bold new normal. Share ideas. Just stay in touch with each other. Let's collaborate. Let's build and create the lives that we desire, the nation we want, and the Africa that we want. It's been wonderful, wonderful being your server for the day. My name is Hilary Ando, and you know, God bless, and I wish you great, great success. And we're taking pictures before you leave. Please come on stage. You can take pictures with Lucy. Um, all the participants, please come and take pictures. Everyone, actually, please come and take a photo. Thank you.